All right, thank you everybody. I want to welcome you to our presentation, Occupational Therapy Assessment via Telehealth. So I'd like to celebrate all occupational therapy practitioners and thank you for joining us today for this presentation. We'll get started by first covering what we'll discuss here today. I know you all are curious, so I've provided you here with objectives of what we're going to cover. First, I'll provide an overview of foundational concepts for telehealth and occupational therapy. Then I'll review best practices for telehealth assessment and conclude by discussing assessments and administration via telehealth. So a little bit about me, I started out in the behavior field while I was obtaining my master's in occupational therapy. I then went on to obtain my PhD in special ed in early childhood and have been interested in telehealth for over a decade, having helped to establish programs and train others. So I've worked in schools, clinics, hospitals, community-based settings, academia, and now as, an, as a consultant. So today I want to help you get an understanding of telehealth and how you can complete assessments through this service delivery model. I wanna let you all know before I proceed that I am employed by Western Psychological Services as an assessment consultant and have no other financial disclosures to make. So let's get started. What is telehealth? The World Federation of Occupational Therapists position statement on telehealth defines it as the use of information and communication technologies to deliver health-related services when the provider and client are in different locations. So a client-centered approach is what's best. So it helps us as health professionals promote health and well-being through occupation. Occupational therapists promote health regardless of the context in which they participate and practice. So that's how telehealth is a part of what we do as occupational therapists and is well within our domains to provide intervention and services. AOTA also has position statements out there for you all to refer to. And telehealth is a service delivery model. I can't stress that anymore, but it's a service delivery model where you can provide consultation services, assessment, progress monitoring for your clients, supervision, if you're working with occupational therapy assistants, as well as the intervention that you would in an in-person environment. One key thing to keep in mind is that you need to have that informed consent piece in place, right? Telehealth isn't new to us and studies date back to early 2000s. And that informed consent has been in place since we started providing therapy in that medical space and other sectors. So it's not going to disappear now that you're in the telehealth realm. You also need to be sure to maintain privacy and confidentiality. In this current day and age, we're having a lot of concerns when it comes to being in. So there are various main means to obtain signatures electronically. I encourage you to look into them. Another thing to consider is your compliance with the licensure laws wherever it is that you reside and where the client resides. It varies by state as well as country. So be sure to know those laws and regulations. You also need to comply with the current standards of practice. Just because you're in the virtual space does not mean you can practice differently underneath the license that you have. And ethics is another area that we need to be mindful of, that you continue to practice ethically. AOTA has a position statement also on that that discuss ethics related to telehealth. I can't stress this enough that telehealth is a service delivery model and you should employ the same ethical standards as you would in everyday practice. You also need to know those regulations once again that govern your practice. During times of crisis, however, executive orders may be issued that alter how you might deliver occupational therapy services. Your professional associations, as well as your lobbyists and the mayors and governors will give you guidance on how that impacts your occupational therapy practice. 
and your professional associations can help you interpret those. So I recommend that you refer to each and every one of those, okay? So next up is telehealth assessment. And Western Psychological Services has a position statement out there to help guide you as it relates to our practices. So our role as a test publisher is to support you as practitioners while also balancing the need to ensure integrity and security. It is important for practitioners considering telehealth assessment services to review the characteristics of the test used in the service the service delivery method, and the provisions for test security and integrity to ensure compliance with legal and ethical standards. Practitioners also should continue to consider the qualifications needed for each test and follow the guidance in the test manual, including standardized administration procedures, scoring, and interpretation, as well as upholding the copyright standards. Keeping in mind that when you're using an assessment over telehealth, you need to document that too and anything that might create variance in the numbers and results that you receive. So make sure you have a statement included in your report. Now let's get on to occupational therapy assessment. OT assessment should be holistic in nature and consider various aspects of the client, whether they're an infant, child, adolescent, or adult. Information should be gathered from multiple sources, including observation, interviews, review of records where possible, and completion of formal and informal assessments. When completing assessments, OT should consider the various domains foundational to our profession. The main focus of assessments and interventions is function, and we should be assessing contributing factors and those areas where a client is having challenges or presenting with differences that affect their performance and participation in occupations. So throughout this presentation, keep in mind that when I say client, I'm referring to the person seeking services as well as keeping in mind that occupational therapists work across the lifespan. Many of you might be in pediatrics, but you can also use some of these assessments with our adult populations. Now I'm taking you back to school a little bit, right? So let's briefly review the domains of occupational therapy that are the focus of our assessments. Many of you get shook when you're in the telehealth space and forget everything you learned when you got into the profession. So for more detailed information, I wanna refer you to review the AOTA, Occupational Therapy Practice Framework, as it will help refresh you on the concepts to be explored in your holistic assessment with your client. So quickly, I'll go over them. Occupations are those meaningful, purposeful, and valuable activities that individuals, groups, or populations engage in. So they consist of activities of daily living, instrumental activities of daily living, rest and sleep, education, work, play, leisure, and social participation. Client factors include values, beliefs, and spirituality. They also include body functions and body structures that reside within the client and influence their performance and participation in occupations. Performance skills are those observable elements of action that have an implicit functional purpose. So skills are considered a classification of actions and they encompass multiple capacities. And when combined, they help you identify the underlying skills and components for participation in those desired occupations and activities. Performance patterns are those habits, routines, roles, and rituals. And when you're working in that telehealth space, you are in that natural environment. So it's best to ascertain them and what they actually look like using telehealth. So these patterns can support or hinder occupational performance. And telehealth gives you a direct window into that in natural context. And lastly, context refers to a variety of interrelated conditions that are within and surrounding the client. They include cultural, which is very much a inherent part of what we do when we're working on telehealth or working through telehealth because culture will determine 
your interventions and what's appropriate in that environment. And you need to be mindful of that throughout. You also have personal, temporal, and that virtual factor. So with assessments, we look at all of these domains to identify strengths, challenges, and differences so that we can support independence and improved functioning with the clients that we're honored to serve. I'm not sure if I lost you guys or not, but I'm going to double check and see if I can find you. Yes, it still says we're live, thankfully. There we go. So keep chatting in there, guys. That's how I know that I haven't lost connectivity, okay? Okay, so up next, we're going to talk about the occupational profile and analysis of occupational performance, right? So as OT practitioners, we encounter young children, students, and adults who may be struggling with being successful in their roles. Our role is to help identify what strengths and challenges can help promote function and improve quality of life. We begin our assessments from a holistic view of occupational performance. That initial step in the assessment process is that occupational profile. Depending on when you came out of school or not, you learn this or not. When I graduated many moons ago, we didn't have this in place, but it is available on the AOTA website. All right, so with that occupational profile, you're gonna gather a lot of background information. It provides an understanding of past experiences and occupational performance history, patterns, interests, values, and needs. The reasons for needing potential service are also evident through this process where you can get those strengths and concerns with regards to performing the occupations and daily activities, occupational disruption, which a lot of us are going through right now, supports and barriers and priorities. Those are the focus of your assessment. And when the progress to complete analysis of occupational performance is there, you wanna identify where those differences and challenges are more closely explored. So performance is analyzed to determine the supports and barriers because we wanna be strength-based. We don't always wanna look at the negative. We wanna consider context, performance skills, performance patterns, client patterns, and occupational demands. See why I had to take you back to school for a second? Because that's the crux of your evaluation. Now, this assessment, what needs to go in it? We need to see a consent form, which I mentioned earlier. You'll need to complete a records review, intake forms, an interview, clinical observations, checklists, assessments, performance base, and rating skills. Both of them fall underneath assessments. It may be a bit difficult depending on which ones you choose for that performance based piece but you also have rating scales, which we'll go over here. So let's start with the records review. We all know what that is. You look at the chart, you look at the school records, whatever you have access to, making sure you have consent forms if you need to get additional ones. Then in telehealth, that consent form that you need is to provide intervention via telehealth. That doesn't change you're going to need that and the consent to con and the consent sorry to proceed with that particular assessment your intake forms can be completed prior to the face to face component of the assessment yes i said face to face because telehealth is face to face traditionally you might have conducted these in person had a link on your website or mailed intake forms to be completed and if you're in the school setting, drop it off to the teacher themselves. Now, as stated, you wanna collect this information and send it probably electronically, okay? And information should be collected from many different sources. The client, where, prop, where appropriate, the caregiver, the teacher, 
at anybody else who has a good working knowledge of that client's occupational performance. Moving beyond that, you go on to the structured interview. So your assessment is very much informed oftentimes through the completion of a structured interview before engagement in those performance-based assessments and tasks. So your structured interview should at least include social history, developmental history, medical history, educational history, any interventions they might have received in the past, their interests, what is it that they like? If you need to engage them with different tools, that's where you're going to get that, through that structured interview. And then any other things you include in your interview, I include their sensory preferences, as well as aversions, what are they seeking, avoiding, hypo, hyper responsivities, motor, ADLs, IADLs, you get the gist. All those things you normally include in your structured interviews, you have them here as well. With your clinical observations, you want to be mindful to look at your muscular skills, gross motor coordination, because they don't need to just sit in front of your screen. Fine motor coordination. You might need a document camera or have your camera close enough on the other side so that you can see what their hands are doing. Visual motor integration. Can you see what it is that they're writing? That's gonna be very important. Um, sensory as well as performance-based tasks. I'm seeing some questions in there. Someone asked, what's the best way to get the consent form from a distance? Virtually, you have to get signatures. There are many apps out there that are secure to allow you to do that. I invite you to look into that. And for those who are looking to review this after, yes, it's gonna be on the page because it saves it for you, okay? And you can reach out to us as well to answer any more questions. I'll give you those details a little later. For checklists, you have informal as well as formal. Informal assessment checklists provide a valuable record for documenting a child's current functioning and even monitor progress in a variety of performance areas. Such resources might help an OT identify developmental or performance strengths and differences in various functional areas. Formal assessment checklists might be those required by your district if you work in a school setting your facility, or even funding sources. So these can be valuable to inform your evaluation process, but standardized measures are also great to help provide information based on norm and criterion reference assessments. Taking you back to school again, because that top-down versus bottom-up approach is very important to keep in mind here. Those bottom-up assessments tend to examine those small separate occupational performance components such as grasping a block, coloring, handwriting, and they focus primarily on the body structure and functional impairments at that level, um, which might include tasks that aren't meaningful to the client and are distinct from those everyday functional activities that they need to engage in. On the contrary, your top-down assessments use a holistic approach to focus on clients' performance and participation within the everyday living context and assess skills and tasks important to the client. Using a top-down assessment approach can help you as the OT address more realistic and relevant occupational performance and participation. So it's advised that you use a top-down approach and choose assessments that focus on critical roles as occupational performance, including what? Those ADLs, education, work, play, rest, leisure, recreation, and social participation. Those domains that I just talked about, right? Now assessments can be performance-based and those are those tasks that an individual completes before you, often with manipulatives and standardized tools. Rating skills are completed by the client if they can give you a self-report or by other families with the client. The, those teachers, anybody else who really knows them, someone who's familiar with them, caregivers, spouses. So we're gonna talk about some assessments, not focusing mainly on the performance base, but the rating skills. 
When we think of those performance-based assessments, I want you to remember that these require the client to complete specific tasks, often using a standardized set of objects or fun functional tools. They might include someone dressing, engaging in meal prep, or completing those items that we're used to, like stacking blocks, stringing beads, things like that. One of the assessments we have at Western Psychological Services is the goal. It's the goal-oriented assessment of life skills. And it emphasizes the motor components of a child's participation in the home, school, and community settings where it looks at fine motor as well as gross motor skills through seven different activities. So if you're curious about that and you've never used it, reach out to us and we can get you more information or visit the website. Rating scales are forms completed by parents, caregivers, teachers, and others who are familiar and know that client. They also include that self-assessment if they can do that. So various rating scales are available through the WPS online evaluation system and can be sent electronically for completion. Now, I said rating scales because they're a great tool to be used with telehealth. WPS has several assessments that are appropriate for occupational therapists to use and be accessed easily through our online evaluation system, OES. So if you hear me saying OES throughout the presentation, that's what I'm referring to. And I'll show you some and review three that are most commonly used in the occupational therapy space. Someone's asking if we're targeting the zero to three population. I'll go over the age range for the different assessments. And yes, we do have some that'll tap into that age range. So this is what my bookshelf looks like because I'm an employee of Western Psychological Services and I have access to all of these. When you make your purchases through o the OES, you have them available on your bookshelf, much like how you might keep your paper-based assessments in your clinic or office. So after creating your account and logging in, those that you have purchased will appear on your bookshelf similar to this. Now I have various listed here and we'll discuss a few with you during this session. So OT frequently are consulted to address sensory, motor, and other occupational performance concerns when completing assessments. Those pictured here are some of those that I've used in practice and I'm glad that they are also available through the online evaluation system. So you have pictured here the sensory processing measure preschool, the sensory processing measure, the adaptive behavior assessment system, third edition, and the developmental profile, third edition. Each of these have been used in a variety of settings. That includes schools, clinics, hospitals, community-based practice, and residential settings. I'm going to start with you all by reviewing the sensory processing measure because oftentimes when people think occupational therapy, the first thing that comes to mind is, oh, sensory, right? So I thought it would be appropriate to begin with the sensory processing measure, preschool, and then go into the sensory processing measure. There's a home form, main classroom and school environment forms for the sensory processing measure and the sensory processing measure preschool has the school form and home form. The authors are listed here for the home form. You have Diane Parham, you have Cheryl Ecker. For the main classroom and school environment forms, you have Heather Miller Kuhanek, I'm horrible pronouncing that, Diana Henry and Tara Glennon. For the sensory processing measure preschool, you have Diane Parham and Cheryl Ecker for the school form, and then Heather Miller Kuhanek. Diana Henry and Tara Glennon for the home forms. So we thank them for developing these measures because they are a great adjunct to our assessments and I personally like them. So let's get started. The sensory processing measure, I'll give you a quick overview. It is a rating form for the assessment of sensory processing issues, praxis and social participation in children ages two to five years old. This is the preschool version, okay? Keep in mind, it's the preschool version. You have the home and school forms that together provide you a broad perspective on sensory functioning in multiple contexts. So it includes the home, 
the preschool environment, and how they're performing in the community. To administer it, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes. So you'll give the form if you had the paper copy, but here you can use the online copy and send that to the parent or the teacher for completion. And it's normed on a nationally representative sample. So some of the highlights of the sensory processing measure preschool is that it's presented in terms understood by parents. I don't know how many times we start talking about proprioception and people looking at us like, what are you talking about? Vestibular processing. It's up to us to educate people on those terms, but we also need to avoid the jargon and present it in terms that people can readily understand. And that's what the sensory processing measure does. It's a downward extension of the sensory processing measure to those younger ages. So it will help you with that two to five-year-old population. There is an overlap at five, which I'll clarify shortly. So it's similar in structure to the sensory processing measure. It's used in education, clinics, as well as research settings. And the results can be used to inform eligibility decisions, as well as to plan your therapeutic interventions. So how do you use it and what's the foundation for it? It is based on air sensory integration theoretical properties. That's the basis for the sensory processing measure preschool. It can be administered by many disciplines, but that interpretation piece is best recommended to be done so by someone who's trained in air sensory integration, like we are as occupational therapists. Now, what does it address? You have several scales. So rather than seeing the jargon, you have functional terms. And these functional terms will help you report back to clients as to what the functional issues are presenting for the client. So we have social participation, vision, hearing, touch, taste and smell, body awareness, balance and motion, planning and ideas. So the lay terms for proprioception, vestibular function, and practice, respectively, are body awareness, balance and motion, and planning and ideas. So remember, this terminology is designed so that anyone can understand it. So the SPM preschool is appropriate for children two to five years of age. I think I'm ahead of you. No, nope, there we go. If the child has not started kindergarten, the SPM preschool is recommended for administration versus the SPM. They must be familiar with the child for at least a month if it's administered in the school. Otherwise, you're not getting a good representation of that child's performance. Someone needs to be familiar with them first. The items are rated on a Likert scale. It's a four point and you have never, occasionally, frequently, and always. It's permissible to read the items to respondents, so that helps, especially in the telehealth space. If someone's not understanding or has some questions, you can go over them with them, and it's available in Spanish too. So how do you administer it? The SVMP can be shared with caregivers and teachers online with it returning to you electronically to be scored. The online evaluation system streamlines this process for you. So forms don't get lost. You don't have to physically mail anything and you can instead just email a link that is scored electronically for you once you verify that all the responses are complete. There's a home form and a school form with identical skills that help facilitate comparison of functional performance across the different settings. Now, I said the OES will score it for you, so you don't have to sit there and hand score all of this. It will give you a report, and I'll show you that later when I get into the SPM. And this is what you're going to get, T-scores. So your T-scores are either in the typical some problems or definite dysfunction range. And you'll also get environmental different scores when you get both forms completed. So you can put them together and see if someone's performing one way in the environment for the school and another way in the environment for the home. 
that's when you really have to consider, is it really a sensory issue or what else could be happening here? So when interpreting the sensory processing measure, remember that you get eight skills, social participation, vision, hearing, touch, taste and smell, body awareness, balance and motion, and planning and ideas. You're going to be provided with descriptive terms that are associated with the score ranges. So I just went over those for typical, some problems, and definite dysfunction. Environmental differences, as I said, can be scored so that you can compare them across environments. And you can see underlying deficits in the areas of modulation of sensory input, sensory perception and discrimination, postural and ocular control, bilateral integration, and sequencing and or praxis. So even though you were given layman terms on your forms, you can still go back to your manual. Also with your scoring, you'll see these terms pop up and you know what they mean and it'll allow you to communicate them to your clients. So I'm a fan of this measure and I'm inviting you to become a fan too. Now I'll move into the sensory processing measure. I see some speech therapists on here also. Thank you guys for joining. So the sensory processing measure is just what it says here. It is relevant, easy to use, it's reliable and valid, it's multidimensional, it covers many different things that are functional. It's time effective and informative in terms that everybody can understand. So a quick overview for this one is it's ages five to 12 years of age, and it's integrated into the rating scales that enable assessment of sensory processing issues, praxis, as well as social participation. It's used in the school settings, clinics, and research settings. See, similar, just like the sensory processing measure. And it can help you determine eligibility for special education and related services, help you with planning your IFSPs and IEPs, and even measure progress over time. So the SPM results are presented in those terms, and I can't stop stressing this, that everyone can understand. Spanish forms are available, and you can access this through our online evaluation system. So there's a manual, and in the manual, if you're used to the classifications of over-responsive seeking, all of that, you'll see those on the quick tips, but it's also in the manual for each of the items as to where they fall. So on the home form, you'll have the parent complete that or a caregiver, the main classroom form, you ideally want the primary classroom teacher to complete this and to have known that child for at least a month. And then you get school environment forms. So this can be completed across multiple contexts. So you can have an art teacher, a music teacher, even the bus driver complete this form. Similarly, the theoretical basis is AIRS sensory integration. The three key dimensions of measurement are the assessment of the sensory systems, sensory integration vulnerabilities, and across multiple environments because you have different rating forms. So both the SPM and the SPMP can be administered and scored by a variety of professional disciplines. And I'll stress again that the interpretation piece needs to be done by someone who understands sensory integration. The domains that are assessed are the same. These areas here, the scales are social participation, vision, hearing, touch, taste and smell, body awareness, balance and motion, planning and ideas. And remember I said earlier that these lay terms equate to proprioception, vestibular function, and praxis, which we use in our OT jargon world, but we wanna be sure to communicate that terminology that others can easily understand too. So the school environment forms, I tell you there are multiple, right? We've got six. So the art teacher, the music teacher, physical education, recess and playground, cafeteria, and school and bus. So we wanna see how that child is performing in multiple contexts. The difference with the school bus rating form is that it only has 10 items, 
where all of the others have 15 and you can access them all through the online evaluation system. So what does that look like? I keep telling you about the OES, the OES, the OES. This is my screen when I went in and created one. And here you see that I sent the form out to the father through the email, but in the school, I said I did it in person. What that looks like is if you have your OES open and you're asking them these questions and you're checking them off like that, that's in person because they're there with you. You would want to send it out in telehealth to someone's email for completion. Now the online scoring forms will give you a report. So it plots everything for you. It's cost effective, meaning that you only use one of your license, your, your forms when someone completes it. Oftentimes you may have a paper form, it's lost, and you have to give them another paper form. You don't have to worry about that here because it's all completed online. What do you get from your scores? You have T-scores. You're able to go back and analyze each individual item response too. You'll have the differences between environments and address those underlying deficit areas. Similarly, descriptive range is the same. Typical, some problems, and definite dysfunction. And this is the environmental differences that I was talking about earlier. So you'll take the home form, the main form, and calculate that difference to see if they're having more problems in the home versus the classroom or the classroom versus the home. Now back to the online evaluation system. Once I get all the reports back and I can view them here, I now can generate reports. So you can generate three types of reports, the score, the quick tips, as well as progress reports. So the score reports provide results from the forms that are electronically scored for you. You can then take both reports to calculate that difference between environments. The quick tips reports help to align your identified areas of problems and dysfunction with recommendations for intervention strategies. You can create one for the home and one for the school. The progress report, which is also neat, allows you to see change over time as you can compare rating forms completed at different time periods. I'll give you a quick look into the quick tips. So what is this quick tips I mentioned? You can use it for the preschool version as well as the older version, the SPM and SPMP. This is a great companion tool to not only help with writing recommendations for your report, but also to help guide your recommendations and interventions. And that's what helps make the SPM stand out for me, is that the SPM quick tips is available. So it's great for many in the telehealth space who are looking for tools and resources to help guide their sessions. And someone's commenting that school staff and parents love the quick tips, so thank you for that. The SPM quick tips, which is appropriate for use with both of these, include suggestions, tasks, and activities designed to help the children cope with their sensory-based challenges. It was designed just for that, to be implemented by a range of persons involved in that child's care under, di under the direction of the practitioner who's trained in SI. Now, the suggestions are organized by the most problematic areas, or you can look for patterns among the items related to the specific system, such as touch, vision, and hearing, and so forth. And this is a sample of what it would look like. So the test client that I put in, they were under responsive to balance and motion. So that's that kid that's always on the go. And it's saying that they seem not to get dizzy when others usually do. So this is based on the client's um, caregiver when they made the report on that particular item. And then I have suggestions over here. So if they spin and whirl and twirl their body, what is that? They're seeking. So if they're seeking, what do we want to do? Encourage them to participate in active games of running and jumping. Take the child to different playgrounds to use a variety of equipment. Now, this isn't auto-populated for you, so you can individually customize and select what's going to be best appropriate for that client based on their unique profile. So it's not templated and you have to go through and say, ah, that doesn't apply to me once you get that report as the caregiver. 
you as the interventionist are going to sit there and choose what's most appropriate. And not only can you send it to the family, it can help you in your telehealth session too. So this is the sensory processing measure preschool. It's for ages two to five years old. And then the sensory processing measure is for the ages of five to 12 years old. Now I'll discuss some other assessments that can help you look at activities of daily living and the other occupational performance challenges that we look at as occupational therapists because we just don't look at sensory, right? So this is another one that I've used in practice, the Adaptive Behavior Assessment System, the third edition, and it's by Drs. Patty L. Harrison and Thomas Oakman. What this assessment does is it can be useful to provide a holistic view of a child or an adult's occupational performance and is yet another adjunct that will be beneficial to your telehealth assessment. And it's holistic, it's top down. It's not looking at those microscopic things like can they stack a block, string a bead, do a button, right? So a little bit about the ABIS-3 is it's versatile, meaning it can be used across the lifespan. It's just not for the pediatric population. It is comprehensive and allows you to assess a variety of domains. It's cost effective and relevant to telehealth as you can share a link through email and have the respondent return it to you, making it also time efficient. It's easy to use and is also available in Spanish. Now, adaptive behavior refers to ways an individual meets personal needs, as well as deals with natural and social demands and expectations in their environment, consistent with their age, educational attainment, and culture. These abilities and skills enable a person to function effectively and independently daily at home, school, work, and the community. As occupational therapists, these include all of the domains that we address through assessment and intervention including those domains I mentioned earlier, right? Your occupations, client factors, performance skills, performance patterns, and context. I see someone saying they're trying to shift from that bottom up approach to that top down. Yes, that top down gives you so much more because it highlights and focuses on the roles and routines and activities that are most important to that client. Now, what does the ABIS-3 provide you with? It focuses on 10 specific skills, communication, community use, functional academics, homeschool living, health and safety, leisure, self-care, self-direction, social, and depending on the age, work for young adults and motor for young children. Now, when you look at it this way, act, adaptive domains are grouped into the three distinct areas, conceptual, social, and practical. Do you see how these align with the occupational therapy domains? Using the ABIS-3 in your assessment helps to identify functional performance challenges that can be quantified and support your clinical observations and the information obtained through the interview process. So where does occupation fit in? Where does play fit in? Where does school and work fit in? ADLs, IADLs, all of that. Cognitive, communication, executive functioning. It's not a direct measure, but you're leading into those underlying factors that might be contributing to performance challenges. So this gives you a rating scale that you can send out to your clients and they can complete this for you. So you have several rating forms, two teacher forms, two parent primary caregiver forms, and one adult form for self-report. The ages are zero to five for the parent primary caregiver, two to five, for your teacher daycare provider, five to 21 for your parent and teacher form, and 16 to 89 for your adult form. The ABIS-3 can be completed by respondents who once again know the daily adaptive behaviors of the individual being assessed. You need to have careful selection of respondents 
because if they're not familiar with the client, then you're not going to get valid information back, okay? You should have had frequent, recent, prolonged contact with that individual. What does that look like? The majority of days, at least a few months, several hours each day, not someone who just checks in and out of that client's life. So you want to have that opportunity to observe the various adaptive skills areas that are measured by the ABIS-3, and that's what the person completing it needs to be able to afford you with. For administration, it's also on a four-point scale, and it looks at ability versus the frequency. So if someone isn't able to do it, you can note that. And if they never or almost never do it when needed, that would be rated as a one. Sometimes when needed, that will be rated as a two. Always or almost always when needed, that will be rated as a three. And it takes about 20 minutes for you to administer this one. For the scoring forms, when you use the online evaluation system, it will do this automatically for you, but it's provided in four domain composite scores. You have your conceptual, social, practical, and then general adaptive composite. Uh-oh, I think I'm stuck. There we go. Okay, so what you're going to yield from this are T-scores. And you have age-related normative scores with the mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. A lot of people want to know these things, so the information is all in the manual. I'm not going to get too technical here on that. You also have skill area scores for those 10 that I, let, I described to you earlier with the mean of 10 and the standard deviation of 3. So you have age-based percentile ranks and age equivalents up to 22 years and descriptive classifications, meaning it's high, above average, average, below average, low, and extremely low in comparison to others. This is what your reports look like. So as I mentioned, here are the score conversions for each of the different skill areas. You have your general adaptive composite, conceptual, social, as well as practical domain composite scores here. It gets plotted on the graph for you. And then you have alternate means that you can interpret these. So if you wanna look at test age equivalents, which we do so with caution, because it's important to acknowledge the limitation of these when used as part of any assessment instrument and should be used with caution. Optional analyses, as I mentioned, include looking at those adaptive domain comparisons, considering the scatter in them, looking at the strengths and weaknesses, as well as comparison between two raters because you're using different forms. With interpretation, it's that top-down approach because you have that global adaptive composite, then you have the different adaptive domains for conceptual, social, and practical, and then you can even go deeper into those specific skill areas. One thing I wanna mention about the ABIS-3 is that it has a companion intervention planner. So this allows you to provide recommendations based on those areas identified as a concern. This also can be helpful to guide joint planning of telehealth intervention sessions with your clients and caregivers. Here's an example of intervention activities that are included in the ABIS-3 intervention planner. Yes, it says communication because we as occupational therapists help address challenges with social participation. So it covers all of the skill areas that I mentioned earlier that were on the previous slide and they have intervention items to align with each. Now, the last one I wanna to mention today is a developmental profile three. It was developed by Dr. Gerald Alpern. Now note that the third edition is great for use in early intervention and the fourth edition will be available this summer expanding the age range through 21 years, 11 months. So the developmental profile three as just stated is relevant for those working in early intervention and with school age youth. It's been used by various disciplines and approved to be valid, sorry, and proven to be valid and reliable for assessing developmental skills as a rating scale. 
The developmental profile three is appropriate for children ages birth through 12, keeping in mind that, that the fourth edition is coming out very soon over the summer and it's expanding that age range. So it can help determine eligibility for special education and related services, can help plan your IFSPs or IEPs consistent with the strengths as well as weaknesses because we want to be strength-based and not only focused on the negative and allow you to measure some progress. The developmental profile three, looks at these domains, physical, adaptive behavior, social emotional, cognitive, and communication. These are all areas that we as occupational therapists can look at. So providing a caregiver with this rating scale can give us valuable information. Here's an example of what a scoring profile would look like. And as I mentioned, it's developed for birth through 12 years, and it includes 180 items, each describing a particular skill. So the respondent simply indicates whether or not the child has mastered that skill with a yes or a no response. So while a parent interview is the preferred method of administration, this can also be done through a caregiver parent checklist. And it contains the same items and can be completed with someone who knows that child's functioning. Scores are available in five formats. So you get standard scores, percentile ranks, stay nines, age equivalents, and descriptive ranges. These give you flexibility in using reporting and explaining test results. For example, you might choose standard scores for eligibility determination or progress monitoring, age equivalents for parent conferences, and stay nines or percentiles for your records. These are the descriptive ranges based on the standard scores obtained. Some, some practitioners use 77 as the cutoff. However, the manual indicates below 70 as demonstrating a deficit at a level warranting attention. So you have well above average, above average, average, below average, and delayed. The mean is 100 and the standard deviation is 15. What I wanna highlight before we wrap all of this up is that the developmental profile four is coming out this summer. So what's changing is that it's expanding the age range to cover 21 years, 11 months. You're going to be able to get growth scores for progress monitoring. That's a game changer. So you can compare Johnny at time point A to Johnny to time point two, especially for those children on other standardized measures who don't seem to move up significantly with each administration. It's updated to reflect society, changes in technology, as well as culture. And you're also getting two new forms to improve overall evaluation, a teacher checklist and a clinician rating form. So you get to provide your input too. You can pre-order that now and learn more at wpspublish.com forward slash DP minus four. So these assessments discussed here can all be found on the online evaluation system. Western Psychological Services has a team of professionals who can help you with navigating this. You only get access to the OES by purchasing directly through WPS. So once you make a purchase, you'll receive an email similar to this. It includes your activation code and detailed instructions on how to activate and access your purchase assessment. So your activation code will be in this box. You can click here, it'll automatically do it for you. And there's videos as well to help support you or you can reach out to us. So I primarily focus this session on three of the most common assessments that an occupational therapist might use. The sensory processing measure, preschool, as well as the sensory processing measure, the ABIS-3 and the developmental profile three. Keeping in mind that the developmental profile four is coming out this summer. You can still use the DP3 now and contact us once the DP4 is released for an exchange. For those working in the area of autism spectrum disorder, you might also consider the social communication questionnaire and the social responsiveness scale second edition. The developmental behavior checklist too is appropriate for assessing social emotional skills in individuals with intellectual disabilities. Feel free to reach out to us if you'd like to know more about these and other assessments. 
Those on this bookshelf are all available on our online evaluation system with others available should you need the paper-based forms. We're also a one-stop shop where you can order assessments from other distributors. So our online system, <coughs> excuse me, can be found at platform.wpspublish.com. There's a short video that shows you how it works and we have others on this Facebook page and on our main website, wpspublish.com. Don't feel as though you have to figure this out on your own. We have several assessment consultants besides myself who are always happy to assist you and even walk you through this process. We can also set up a virtual session with your organization. So feel free to reach out to us, <clears throat> excuse me, at consultwpspublish.com. Your email will be routed to one of our assessment consultants and we'll get back to you. So we appreciate you for taking the time to attend this session and look forward to hearing from you. Telehealth is new to many of you and we're here to support you with that assessment component. Keeping in mind that some of these assessments also have companion intervention resources That'll be great for your intervention too. We have a discount code for our online evaluation system products that can be found on our website at wpspublish.com. Also reach out and contact us at consult at wpspublish.com as we're here to help. Where others see limits, we see potential. WPS helps clinicians just like you unlock the potential of the children, families, and clients you serve. Thanks again, and let us know how we can continue to support you. Thanks for watching this presentation.